Hello, this is Solar PV TV from SPI 2016. And it's so interesting now because we are with, uh, together with Dr. Solar, <laughs> with Dr. Solar, with uh, Charlie Gay, who just became uh, the director for solar technology at uh, Department of Energy in the United States. Uh, I would say in a different way of Sunshot Initiative. So yes, uh, I'm delighted to have the chance to finally sit down together with you, Thomas. We've known each other a long time. Uh, it's so exciting because uh, you started your history in solar like 42 years ago, and now you are leading you know, the solar activities in the United States. And I would like to ask you, Charlie, first, could you tell us, and also to our international viewers, uh, in a few bullet points, your 42 years history in solar? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, when I left graduate school, uh, was the uh, just the end of the first oil embargo and at that time I thought maybe working in solar could be an opportunity for me in the future and I found a job at a company called Spectralab making solar cells for communication satellites and uh, shortly after that several years after I had been at Spectralab the second oil embargo took place and many large corporations at that time looked into ways to diversify their portfolio of businesses so they wouldn't be so vulnerable to the kinds of change and crises that could come with oil embargoes and Atlantic Richfield was one of those companies. Uh, Arco, as it's called, hired me to be the director of research uh, at Arco Solar. Uh, we built up an organization in the first several years of nearly uh, for the total company, nearly 600 people and about 100 employees that formed the core of our research and development group and our manufacturing effort. It was at uh, the time, sorry, when you uh, launched the first one meg megawatt uh, production line? We accomplished one megawatt in less than one year in 1980. At that time, we were the largest manufacturer of solar cells and modules in the world. And in 1982, we built a one megawatt power plant in Southern California in the desert connected to the Southern California Edison substation called Lugo. So today we have power plants with 300 megawatts, for example. Yeah. Yes, so a lot of the design ideas that came out of doing that first one megawatt plant have essentially been scaled. And much of the design ideas that go into today's solar module actually were pioneered back in the late 70s and the early 80s at Arco Solar uh, because the durability and reliability that we had already demonstrated has now proven itself for over 40 years. There are still solar modules in the field today that were built 40 years ago and have the same output. So there's a lot that we can do in the design of our modules to make them last a long time. So even it was like an early stage of the technology? This was very early on and we had a lot to learn. It turns out the most complicated thing was how to get the two wires out of the module, the plus and the minus. And to do that without having problems with corrosion or um, stress on the interconnects at that termination point. And we ended up solving a lot of that, especially with collaboration with our customers who gave us a lot of good feedback about what worked and what didn't. So then uh, you are in Siemens. Uh Yes, Arco Solar, uh, we formed two joint ventures in the middle of the 1980s. One for Asia with Shoah Secu, which uh, ultimately became Shoah Shell, and one in Europe for Europe and Africa with Siemens. Uh, our two joint venture partners helped us expand our markets in the rest of the world that we couldn't really serve readily from the U.S. And um, in the uh, time period of 1990, Arco Solar was acquired by Siemens Solar. And I moved from being the president of Arco Solar to president of Siemens Solar. And what about uh, Enrol, actually, because you are also at Enrol? Yes, I was director of the National Renewable Energy Lab during the first Clinton administration. And uh, joined at a time that uh, people were very interested in adapting the uh, strategic planning methods that were common in industry to the strategic planning that national laboratories could apply to our uh, practical needs across the U.S. And Charlie, I would like to ask you, because uh, you are following up, let's say, this 
not only energy change, but also social change uh, within the industry in, in the United States, but also in other countries. And how would you describe the people, the pioneers who were starting solar, and if you compared, uh, compare them to the people who are in solar now? I would say uh, we, sh we share a common dream, that that vision of seeing solar deployed across the world uh, when, when I got started in solar, I was especially interested in bringing electricity to people in developing countries and areas that didn't have access to electricity. And that's where our markets were during the first 25 to 30 years of my career. And today, it's delightful that no matter where you live, you can use solar. Uh, and the people that I meet today, some of them have only been in the industry for six months or, or less than a year but they bring the same passion and enthusiasm that the early pioneers had. Okay, Charlie, so now let's um, speak a bit about your new job. Yes. So uh, could you tell us, uh, to our viewers, also international viewers, uh, something more about uh, Sunshot Initiative and also about the efforts of your uh, department uh, uh, within the Department of Energy? Yes. So uh, the solar program is one of a number of clean energy initiatives and energy efficiency programs within the U.S. Department of Energy. The SunShot initiative was started in 2011, five years ago, we're sort of halfway through the 10-year time frame of SunShot. SunShot was created to drive down the overall cost of electricity coming from solar, whether it's solar photovoltaics or concentrating solar thermal systems. So the group that I am responsible for works in both of those broad brush areas. And um, it turns out uh, that not only is my background appropriate from the photovoltaic side, but as a graduate student, I spent 10 years working on the thermodynamic properties of fluids, critical uh, point materials like xenon and CO2, which today are very important for optimizing turbine design used in concentrating solar or any other um, energy uh, generation uh, form that uses a turbine. So I've uh, had, it's uh, only the third week that I've been in my role here but already had a great opportunity to get to know people that are uh, in the SunShot team. Uh, have been, some of them have been working there for over 25 years, bring a huge history of experience. And within the Department of Energy, SunShot can coordinate and collaborate with grid modernization initiatives so that a lot of the opportunity for accelerating the scaling of solar will be possible because we're at the hub of where these kinds of interconnections of technology, of grid infrastructure, of information systems that are so critical for today's grid can be brought together in a, in a very effective and efficient way. And uh, what about, uh, let's say, the, the um, activities supported by SunShot. Is it only technology-based activities or also awarded activities? SunShot, um, over the course of its history, has been involved in awarding over 500 different contracts. Today, over half of those are still active in our engagement, and it covers the spectrum from the basic science associated with understanding the fundamental underpinnings that uh, relate to the performance of materials for solar, all the way through to deployment applications um, covering uh, areas that um, might be possible by mobilizing community solar, for example, uh, saving on the inverter costs, uh, the balance of systems as we call it, how you mount a, a solar panel and uh, most cost-effectively wire them together or permitting costs, soft uh, costs as they're referred to in general, that uh, may benefit from seeing best practices that are applied across the U.S. where we have over 3,800 different utilities and over 18,000 different jurisdictions. So each of these areas like is, a matrix. is evolved in a, in a very uh, complex interwoven way that uh, we're seeking to simplify, streamline, 
and enable the use of information systems to share best practices as rapidly as we can. But you are only focusing on the United States or you are also collaborating on the inter international level? We have our principal focus is here in America. Uh, it's American taxpayer dollars that are being spent by the Department of Energy to help advance the use of solar in the U.S. But much of our learning has a, an impact on the rest of the world. We do have collaborative connections in our international group in the Department of Energy that link to solar. So the solar team has uh, connections in Brazil, in India, in Australia, in many countries where the lessons and insights that one part of the world can develop and learn can be shared in our own use or vice versa, where what we've learned about being able to deploy solar at an at a ever faster rate, we can help the rest of the world adopt those best practices. I know that you believe that solar can be like, uh, solar renewables can be like 100% of energy. Would you like to also bring this vision to the Department of Energy? Ultimately, we'll need the sun to power everything. So there's no question that the use of solar is uh, important for the long haul. And our, my efforts in the Department of Energy are really about how can we accelerate the integration of solar into the existing framework that we already have. So we make the best use of what already exists. In many locations across the U.S., in a utility, the power plant may contribute only 40% of the capital cost, and the wires that connect people, 60% the infrastructure. of the cost is associated with wire. So we need to be able to move electrons, and to move them most effectively, we need wire. We need to be able to use what we already have as well as we can. And recent studies have shown that you can integrate up to 30% of solar into the grid here in the U.S. without needing to make changes to the system, being able to bring information technology to bear on how we deploy the solar. And I'm, I'm very happy because I've seen studies that look like this going back early in my career to the late 70s and early 80s, which had the same result. So each time uh, an organization has been involved and in looking at and evaluating how much solar can we put in the grid, it's come up pretty much with the exact same answer. So I'm confident that we can put a lot of solar in the grid. We're less than 1% now. We have a lot of room to go and a lot of ways to go here to be able to see the expansion of solar. And the kinds of challenges we have really are about how we build bridges between our technology and other possibilities that have also evolved from the time of the first oil embargoes. We've all been thinking about what we can do to do our part. It's been interesting as well that the grid, uh, a country like Germany, which has a large amount of solar built into the grid, as more solar has been added to the grid, the grid has become more stable, more predictable. There have been less uh, outages across the grid. Those are insights that I think we can learn from in our own uh, world as we expand the deployment. So uh, recently we are visiting India, Brazil, China, and I remember like five or six years ago I was speaking with Ron Esch, and I asked him, Ron, do you believe that uh, US will become the largest, the most important solar nation? And actually now China would like to become the biggest solar nation, even India. And uh, I'm not sure if US uh, still has the ambition to become the largest solar nation? Well, I certainly would love it for every nation to expand the use of solar, uh, without a question. Uh, we, we pay close attention to what's happening in the state of Hawaii here in the U.S. because it's really a test bed for massive adoption of solar. One out of six homes in Hawaii already has a photovoltaic rooftop. So learning how to use the solar that we have already in the grid from the rooftop systems, together with the existing grid, an island state like Hawaii is a great platform for us to learn lessons that can be expanded uh, in other it's parts like, of like, the Like US. a showcase, yes? It's a, definitely a showcase. It's a, uh, an area where 
My grandfather was born actually out at the end of the Hawaiian island chain and the, the small island called Ni'ihau, which is just beyond Kauai, was the first island to be totally solar powered in, in the Hawaiian islands. So I'm very pleased to have the legacy that my ancestors who still solely live on that island were the first to adopt solar for the entire island and they all speak native Hawaiian. Whoa. So it's a, so it's I think a that your grandfather, wonderful legacy to have. Your grandfather would be proud that now uh, his grandson is, uh, let's say, spreading solar energy into the whole country. Yeah? I like to think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Charlie, so it was a very interesting uh, talk. Just I would like to ask you the last question because uh, you are one of the visionaries, yes? And I would like to ask you, not only maybe like in the United States, but also on a global level, uh, when, let's say, solar will become like a mainstream energy and what still needs to be done? Solar is certainly mainstream now because so much of the new uh, generation capacity being added to the grid is solar. Well over a third of new electricity here in the U.S. is solar. And the challenges that we have relate to how best to use the rest of the assets that exist, the grid assets, the distribution network, because we're working with distributed energy resources. The sunlight shines everywhere, and so it's distributed and it's available to everybody. So being able to use our know-how of information systems, basically the cloud, which can store all of the information about where the sun is shining, how much electricity we may need in a given area tomorrow based on uh, projected weather forecast and changes in demand, can then be used to create a vision for long-term for next week, for tomorrow, for the next hour, for the next 15 minutes. Our ability to uh, help the operators of the network have access to the information, I think, is one of the keys to ultimately succeeding here with expanding adoption of solar. Okay, Charlie, so thank you so much. And it was really a pleasure to speak to person who is a history of solar and now is helping to build the future of solar in the country. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thomas. It's been a pleasure to get to sit here and, ch and chat with you and the rest of the viewers. Thank you so much. That was Solar PV TV together with uh, Dr. Solar, with Charlie Gay, who now is in charge of the solar technology at uh, Department of Energy in the sunny United States. Thanks for watching.